We've invited the CEOs of three of the leading brands in the CBD beverage space to join us. We'll have Benjamin Witte, who is the founder and CEO of Recess, a consumer wellness brand creating products and experiences designed to help people feel balanced, centered, and inspired so they can be their most productive and creative selves despite an increasingly stressful world. Prior to Recess, Ben served as a partner at Life Capital and head of mobile at AdRoll. Jonathan Eppers is the CEO and founder of Vibes, a wellness beverage crafting organic drinks made with hemp CBD. Jonathan made the switch from tech to CPG after he began using CBD to help his own anxiety. And this eventually led to the origins of Vibes, which is now one of the emerging category leaders. And last but not least is Joey Kanata, who's the president and CEO of Daytrip, a CBD enhanced sparkling flavored water that launched earlier this year. Joey is a veteran of the beverage business, having spent 17 years as one of the founding members of Rockstar Energy Drink. So, guys, come on up. Thank you. All right. Thanks for joining me up here. Thanks for having us. Hopefully that showdown was a good warm up for the panel here. <laughs> and oddly we had no CBD beverages, but um, you know, let's start off and just go direct into kind of, you know, the regulatory elephant in the room and you know, maybe you guys can I, I know you've been talking since we had our, our panel call too. Um, you know, I'm just kind of uh, would start out by asking, you know, kind of where you guys stand, you know, with that and where you think, you know, we are or you guys are as a CBD beverage category. Happy to take it. Um, so I think it makes sense to take a step back and ask yourself like how we got to this place to begin with. Um, you know, fundamentally the Hemp Farming Act, which was introduced by Mitch McConnell, basically from my perspective says, we want hemp to be the future crop of America. Um, and it's really a red state farmer's bill at the, at the uh, fundamentally. And it accomplished two things. It basically allowed and encourages like all 50 states to cultivate hemp and removed CBD and hemp extract from the controlled substance list, shifting the regulation from the DEA to the FDA. Now, something's not just gonna go from you know, a controlled substance to something you can put in a drink overnight and sell at Whole Foods, Target, and Walmart. We're obviously gonna go through a process to determine what's the maximum dosage, what are the testing requirements, what are the labeling requirements, what are the marketing claims you can or cannot make, and that passed exactly a year ago. Um, and so to me, it's not, I think it was a misconception that the Hemp Farming Act was the end of the road. It was really the beginning of the road. And, you know, as it relates to last week's FDA statement, um, I think it was a little bit overblown. And uh, I think it's as important what was not said as what was said. Um, for example, if they really wanted to slow down the growth of the category, they would have sent, you know, us three on the stage letters and the retailers and distributors letters. Uh, but they didn't. They only sent them to kind of the worst actors in the space. Um, and they also said that they continued to work on developing kind of a set of regulatory guidelines. And so um, I don't think it's, um, I think it's just a bump in the road. Um, and I still expect sometime next year to see more regulatory clarity. And then there's also a lot happening on the on individual states. So for example, yesterday in New York, a big bill uh, basically got, um, is on the path of getting signed, so. Yes. Yeah, it, it really does come down, down to bad actors. Um, none of these brands up here make health claims, and that's number one red flag. So, you know, there was 15 companies that received letters from the most recent bulletin that was put out by the FDA. One of them, you know, marketing or encouraging you to uh, use their product for infants and children, which is just stupid. So it really comes down to that, people that are making health claims. And, um, you know, I know all of us up here and a lot of our competitors you know, we test for metals and pesticides. Um, we have certificates of analysis. Jonathan's done a great job um, being ahead of it all, actually having um, access to their COAs on their website. And that's a model we're going to be following as well because it makes sense. Um, and after you guys, it's funny because uh, John got us on the phone to talk about, you know, what are we going to talk about? I want to talk about how your brands stand out. And he said, I don't think we're going to talk about regulation. I don't think we have enough time. And we were all kind of like, mm, like, that's what everyone's going to want to hear about. That's what, you know, that's the elephant in the corner, right? And so here we are today 
talking about that. So after we were connected by BevNet, um, we decided to start a consortium, um, starting with our three companies, to really have one single voice and message and work together to get the um, regulatory moving along in, in favor of the category. It's just a, it's just a matter of time. Um, I'm a big believer in it. I got into this category initially as an investor. I looked at multiple brands. I um, looked in, I talked to people I know um, in politics. And you know, the feedback was, it's just a matter of time before this gets passed, mainly because it's, it's kind of like, I, I've always compared it. Ben said in an interview with you guys a while ago as well, it's, it's similar to what happened with touring in Canada. Um, and you know, Red Bull, when we started Rockstar, it was 2001. Red Bull had been in Canada, I don't remember, maybe one or two years at that point, but it, was, it wasn't very long. Before that occurred, um, before Red Bull was in, in Canada, there was literally no Red Bull anywhere. You'd find it in bordering uh, geographies, uh, like um, out, you know, outside of Michigan or New York State or up in the Northwest. You'd see it in those towns in, in Canada, but it wasn't on the shelves, it wasn't in Couchetard, it wasn't in Max Convenience, it was nowhere. In, in that world, just as CBD beverages today aren't in 7-Eleven or... Um, Actually, you know, they are. They are? Well, yeah. <laughs> We're in 7-Eleven. They're not supposed to be, but <laughs> Target, Walmart, as an example. Um, I think we got in one, too. So um, it, it wasn't everywhere yet. Um, and, and so as soon as Health Canada allowed touring to go into food and beverage, it opened up the floodgates, and Red Bull was literally everywhere within you know, three months, because all the retailers were watching it, they knew it was hot category, they knew it was gonna um, augment their revenues, and they needed it for their, for their business. And so, I feel it's gonna, the same thing's gonna occur, for sure, um, with CBD. And, and it all goes back to agriculture, farming communities, you know, the hemp bill passed, and I think next will be hemp 2.0, because as Ben pointed out, the hemp bill, um, it, it, it looked at the traditional uses of hemp, rope, clothing, cement, whatever, um, and it allowed you to, to grow it and transport it across state lines without federal intervention. And now the 2.0 version is going to be um, allowing it to go in food and beverage, because the farmers need that. Um, every politician wants to support farming communities. It's the, it's the bloodline of the country, and it's just a matter of time, in my opinion. Um, and, and they need help too. The trade wars are not helping farmers right now. And there's a supply and demand issue with hemp. A lot of hemp, you go up to Oregon right now, you see hemp fields just dying because they don't have enough to fulfill. They, they have enough product, but there's not enough demand. And so I think this will increase demand. It's gonna really help out farmers at the end of the day. And Jonathan, you wanna add anything? I mean, I think these two got it covered. Okay. I mean, I, I guess, you know, the, the key things are is the safety of our products and reassuring, I think, consumers and, and regulators that uh, our products are, you know, made in food grade facilities, are labeled properly, and they're dosed at what they say they are. And I think, you know, from, cons from the consumer standpoint, I think a lot of consumers have been talking about, like, is there actually the amount of CBD that it says on the label? So we've always tried to work very hard, at least with vibes, of, of making sure that, like, what we say is in the bottles and on the bottle, and then giving consumers and regulators the data that they need to see that for themselves, not just take our word. And that gets back into the certificate of analysis and independent lab results that we, we display. So. And that's awesome you're in 7-Eleven. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Sorry, Joe, I didn't mean to call you <laughs> that's out. That's all good. <laughs> um, so, I mean, as this, you know, I guess kind of from what you guys are saying, it sounds like, you know, to some extent, you know, the rest of the world is in this holding pattern, right? And I guess, you know, to some extent, you guys are in a holding pattern. Um, you know, let's assume that things sort of progress forward as far as regulation, like, you know, how's that gonna change the strategy of, of your companies? You know, are we gonna start seeing, I don't know, a more uh, outward promotion of CBD on the packages where I know some of you have kind of dialed that back a bit. Y you know, what kind of changes? So. Like my thesis around CBD is that it's a compound no more interesting than caffeine or whey protein, just a commoditized functional ingredient that's going to be added to many products, and the value is going to be creating the right applications and formulations, so a dissolvable tablet versus an iced tea versus sparkling water, you name it, it can be done. But I think most importantly, building the brand on top of it, and it's kind of a social construct that we're even having this conversation. Like the only reason we're having it is because it's been illegal. Right. But I don't think fundamentally consumers want to hear 50 facts about hemp all day. They want to know how it makes them feel. Like one of the things I like to say is that uh, they don't call it the, the caffeine category, they call it the energy category, right? Just like CBD fundamentally is about a feeling that it enables. So, uh, you know, from, at least from Recess's approach, you're not going to see us get any more 
um, you know, outward about the, the marketing. It's going to kind of fade to the background. But what I think is going to happen is that I believe that this is going to be like the fastest growing category ever. Um, because what I, it's like, it feels like CBD is everywhere, but it's actually nowhere in the grand scheme of things because it's not in the national retailers. Mm -hmm. But despite that, it still has this like interest and awareness that's off the charts. And so I think when the FDA kind of clarifies the regulatory dynamics, um, basically every national retailer is going to launch within a two month period and they're not going to put these products in the back. Like they're going to launch with massive end caps. And I think that's going to drive a massive compounding effect mm -hmm. um, for that. And so, look, I think our, you know, our collective biggest competition, you know, up here doesn't exist yet. And that's going to come from, you know, the major large beverage brands. And so, you know, at recess, you know, I wake up every day figuring out like, what are the things we can be doing today that will allow us to compete against kind of Coke, Pepsi and Anheuser-Busch in a year from now? Well, I think also what's different about this category versus any other in the past where Coke and Pepsi haven't, you know, put their, you know, toe in the water. Um, typically, those early stage brands do have some beachhead that they built with major retailers. In this case, no one has that, right? So I guess how do you, you know, prepare yourselves so that you do have that advantage when the floodgates open? Well, I think first is timing. Um, just being in the, you know, I keep saying we fish where the fish are. Right now, the pond's pretty small, but it's there. And so, and, and that includes states. And, you know, we all, we're in a lot of the same accounts um, in various states. And a lot of them are, are regional players. They don't operate in multiple states. They're not publicly traded companies. There's less of a risk for them to do it. So, you know, that is a value right there to have someone go into those accounts and see one of our brands as one of the early ones um, in the market and no offense to coke and pepsi and diageo and constellation and budweiser you know i've worked with many of them and a lot of friends at coke and pepsi and kdp now um you know they're a lot of their growth over the years has come from m a activity there i can't think of many brands that were created from scratch um, there, of course, there's some, but most of the growth from those companies have come from acquisitions, not, not from the ground up. It's a slow moving ship with a lot of them and they can't make decisions as quickly or, you know, decide on things. Everything's by committee. Um, whereas, you know, we're able to do that faster and get to market faster and kind of pivot as we get there and pivot, pivot as we're in the market already, not have to worry about, you know, someone voting, voting it or going to another office for approval. So timing. And let's talk about, you know, the products a little bit. I mean, there are tons of products coming into this space that I guess, Joey, you were calling them, you know, bad actors, I think. Um, you know, you guys have taken a pretty sort of simple and, and clean approach. Um, you know, some companies are just going right at it with putting CBD all over the place or saying things. Maybe they're not claims, but they're saying doesn't get you high and stuff like that. You know, from the perspective of people who are in it, you know, what's kind of like the right way, if there is one right now, to present these products? Well, look, for, for Reese's, again, I go back to the idea, like, why are people using CBD? Well, fundamentally, they're using CBD because they want to feel calm and they want to reduce stress and anxiety. Um, and so I don't even view Reese's as a CBD company. Like, it's a key input that allows us to you know, fulfill our mission. But the big idea of recess is taking a recess, mm -hmm. which is taking a moment throughout your day to reset and rebalance so you can be your most productive and creative self. And what we've learned is that there's just a lot of different ways people are taking a recess. So there's a group of people that like to take a recess right when they get up in the morning to start their day calm, and another group of people that take a recess right before they go to bed. You know, the core use case is 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. at your office, at lunch, as a substitute for coffee. We think we have as big of an opportunity on-premise as off-premise. And so I think what's so exciting about this category and why I think it's going to be bigger than energy drinks is because there's just many more consumption occasions and there's many more points of distribution that makes sense for these, you know, all these products to be sold at. Right? Um, and so I, I would encourage other people looking at the space is to focus you know, not so much on the ingredient, but someone's going to create the recess for fitness or the recess for you know, the equivalent of the CBD drink for fitness. And so, I like focusing on like the sub segment and the use case more than the ingredient itself because it's just a commodity. And I think for us, I vibes like we've we've gone a little bit of a different direction. We've uh, really tried to own CBD. 
Um, when I when we came out with Vibes in January 2018, like we actually put CBD right on the front of the label, which right. is something that a lot of others weren't doing. We were also putting the dosage on there, which is something that a lot of others weren't doing. And we thought that was important because uh, you know, I, my experience getting this category is from my own health experience, and it was CBD, which pr kind of brought me into beverage. And um, uh, I, there's real proven medicinal value with CBD. And we've, we've kind of gone the premium route. Is, is in, you know, there's a lot of innovation, I think, going in sparkling and can. And so I think one of the ways we've tried to differentiate ourselves is, is by being the premium in the category, really focusing on like a, a higher dosage of CBD, one that I think we feel gives you the, the most potential to feel the CBD, uh, which I think is really important for people who are willing to spend the kind of money that our products cost. You're not going to spend $8 on a beverage if, if it just tastes good. It's got to actually perform for you. And so we've really tried to focus on the science that goes inside the bottle um, and really trying to start owning that. And I think there'll be some things we start doing in 2020 that really help kind of bring that out to light a little bit more. And, you know, speaking of price, your, your product in particular, I think, is the most expensive of the, the three here. Um, you know, is there pricing pressure yet, or is this, you know, a category where sort of the sky's the limit right now? Well, when I, when, when, when I came out with Vibes, we were, we were the only really ones on the shelf. And so you could only, if you wanted to try CBD, and a lot of people were excited to try it, like you, you would pay $8 for it. And then Ben and Joey came along, and now they're putting pressure on us to like, <laughs> um, but, but in all truthfulness, I think we're all sort of like, you know, if you look at where we're all sort of dosing and pricing the format of our beverages, I think they're all sort of in line with one another. And, um, you know, the, because there is proven medicinal efficacy with CBD, I think people want to pay more for that. Um, you know, if, if you're stressed and anxious and you don't want to go see your doctor and CBD works, I think people will pay for that. Um, and 30% of the cost of goods that go into the beverage is the CBD. I kind of consider it medicine. I mean, I don't, you know, we can't say it on the label. I, outside of BevNet, probably won't be talking about that. But for me, it is medicine. I could take CBD every day. And it's really changed my life. And I think that, you know, for people who do feel CBD and it works, they're willing to, they're willing to pay for that. But I do think as, as our products hopefully eventually make it into the chain accounts, the price will come down a little bit. It has to. Yeah. Um, and so we're preparing for that. I agree. And back to pricing, um, and I talk to my partner, Sean, about this all the time. You know, it's, it's, you know, I used to argue with them. I don't know. It's kind of too much. And I, I think what's going to occur is it's, it's going to be what happened with kombucha. I remember going to a Whole Foods years ago and kombucha was like nine bucks or 10 bucks. I'm like, what the hell is this thing? It's ridiculous. But I tried it and I liked it. That's gone down. Now you can get kombucha, good health aid or GTs for three to five bucks at Whole Foods. Um, you know, but I, got, I think the pie got bigger. Production costs came down. And it, that was passed on to the consumer. On the flip side, you know, everyone in this room, probably at least once a week, quite, quite truthfully, probably seven times a week, goes to whole, uh, Starbucks and buys a coffee, latte with vanilla, venti, this, that. And it's like six bucks, no problem. And it's filled with a ton, ton of sugar on top of it all. So, and I'm not saying the whole country's like that, or the whole world, I mean, but there is a, there is a consumer for products that's, Three ninety nine, four ninety nine, seven ninety nine, nine ninety nine in New York. You know, it's it's there. But I do think costs will come down as the pie gets bigger. Um, and I think kombucha is the best example that I that I that I use frequently because that's that's what happened there. Product hasn't changed; it's still the same product. And I guess you know you were part of another category that had an explosion of products and I think at the time, you know, plenty of uh, bad actors too for going back in time. You know, what sort of like parallels, if any, do you see or, or lessons from, you know, the experience at Rockstar and how that category was built? Well, the first one I think is, is touring, um, like I, I referenced right. earlier, you know, we were, you know, God, what's going to happen with Canada? But it was, you know, before that, but we were worried about that, but then the Red Bull thing happened with Health Canada allowing it, so it wasn't an issue anymore. Just being patient, you know, waiting for things to kind of fall into place. Um, and then, you know, I remember when we did the first NAC show back in like 2001 or two, and there was probably 200 energy drinks that were in the market, and there was probably 40 or 50 that were actually had booths at the, the NAC show. And it was, um, it was discouraging to see as a brand, like, oh, God, there's all these brands. This thing's called, you know, Red Dog and this guy and blah, blah, blah. But uh, we just stayed focused on our, on our message and our brand and putting together the best team. And I really think at the end of the day, it comes down to, to team, timing, and trademark. And 
these are three of the best trademarks in my opinion in the category and and it's really just about keeping the head down and as ben said earlier it is it's just discouraging as as things you know it's a roller coaster with the fda we have some pretty big chains that were like okay we're going to do it we do all this you know our, our director of operations does all the paperwork we get them you know insurance information everything um samples photo shoots and then it's like oh we got the new fda announcement there's no there's no enforcement either you sure. know it's all local health departments all right yeah, and again, in, in my opinion, the less there are, I, I compare, see, you know, the categories to energy drinks, and I think my lessons are around brand, right? Uh, you know, Red Bull, Monster, Rockstar didn't compete on marketing. How much caffeine and taurine's in a can? It's about Red Bull gives you wings, um, and I think it's the most brand-driven category because, you know, you wanted to create the association with having a Red Bull and getting stimulated. So they basically created a media business uh, focused on the action sports community. And that's really what we're going to do at recess. Uh, we're, you know, just like Red Bull focused on action sports and Gatorade focused on professional athletics, we're focused on creatives, so music, fashion, art, design, internet culture. That's who kind of we're speaking to. And I think it comes across in, you know, our, our marketing strategy to date. Cool. Before we run out of time, I guess your, your consortium, is this something that is open to other brands or what's the plan for that? Yeah, we've um, we've we've talked about that internally, and and there's um, there's definitely some interests. Uh, we're talking about possibly doing a, a white paper concept, um, sharing in the cost on that. You know, That's something we did in the energy category in 2013 when there was some congressional issues with um, with uh, I think it was mainly Red Bull, but um, bringing mine kind of what Jewel's going through today. Sure. Um, so we're we're looking at doing that so we can get some time, some real scientific research by real true professionals, scientists and doctors to prove that, you know, it's, it's like, it, it's back to taurine. It's a, an amino acid that has proven benefits. Awesome. Well, I guess we're uh, out of time. Thank you very much for joining us up here and uh, best of luck in 2020. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thank you.